Sportages. Sport gets smarter. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Sportages video cast. Our guest today, well, he has years of experience playing and administrating in sport, both here in Australia and overseas. Previously, he played cricket in Hong Kong, was the first CEO of Hong Kong Cricket, and is now one of the many involved with the volunteer-led emerging cricket platform. Welcome to the show, Tim Cutler. Sushan, great to be here, and uh, thanks a lot for asking me on. Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure, mate. Look, we'll get straight into it. Um, I don't think emerging cricket needs an introduction, but I'll give you uh, a very quick uh, opportunity to share what, what it is that you guys do. Well, as you said, a volunteer-led group. We started at the back end of 2018 with three of us on a podcast and uh, me buying a domain name. And so I think, geez, a year and a half later, or coming up to two years later, time, time flies. We've got a group of over 40 volunteers now provide content, uh, whether it's con- stories or interviews or photos or other things like stats analysis or even help on the website from around the world. I think there's about 15 countries represented there. Everybody volunteers their time and podcasts, websites, uh, partnerships with a couple of events, the Vanuatu T10 Blast, uh, the Thailand women's cricket team. We, we supplied a media manager uh, to help project their story to the world during the, the T20 World Cup. And it just keeps going from strength to strength and more so in the last few months with even more great volunteers that come on. The, uh, the numbers spiking up in, uh, in, in Google are starting to sort of get the eyes rolling a bit. But um, I guess when you're amb- ambitious, you want to go even higher and higher. But I, look, I'm pretty proud of, uh, of everyone's efforts to come together to, to help tell these stories. Absolutely. You know, I'm, I, I read, uh, I don't, I, unfortunately, I don't listen to enough perhaps, but I do list, I do read a lot of the content that you guys produce and I think you're doing a, an awesome job. So keep at it. And for everyone who's listening or watching, uh, do check out the description cause you'll have, uh, all the different platforms where you can reach out and learn more about emerging cricket from, Tim, like I said, let's get straight into it. Look, you've been involved in associate cricket as a player, administrator, media personality, you name it. What are some of the general issues? Because we all know that there are significant issues faced across associate cricket nations. What are some of the, I guess, general issues that exist today in your opinion? Well, first, it's the first time I've ever been called a media personality, so I'll have to, I'll have to add that to my list. I'll, um, my mum's unfortunately not, not around anymore, but that would have been something that I would have texted you. you mum, you never guessed what I got, got called today. You know, it's the same when I finally met Dean Jones in real life. Mum, mum, I've, I've met my hero. You know, I think <laughs> the little kid inside of you always comes. Well, geez, the, the problems that associate cricket faces, a lot of them are very sim- similar to what cricket faces itself, but I, it's a v- very specific set of problems um, for the associate nations because they're funded so differently by the ICC, and that's why my top line answer there is that the funding and the general support from the ICC, you know, the ICC, I'm, I'm sure that we'll talk more about, but isn't this big behemoth, but they've got this great division called the development team, but they need funding to try and help and roll out programs and, and whatnot. But even within countries itself, it's getting government support and, and government buy-in. And, you know, you look to, to one end of the spectrum where, you know, a cricket mad nation like Nepal, but struggles from an administrative point of view and all the way to a Russia that uh, even had the government refuse to acknowledge cricket as a sport. And so much of what this is, is linked to is, is not only the, the abilities of the, the administration itself to have buy-in with local and regional national governments, but it's also what governments listen to. And a lot of the times that, that is the Olympic Games. Um, and lastly, and I know this is a big issue for a lot of people that watch associate cricket, is it's about the game growing outside of its, its original base. Now, and that might be from a, a group of expat, expats that have moved to a country and, and started the game there, but it almost sometimes is busting out a perception that it's only an expat or, or foreigner's game, which I think can hold a game back where you might have have people in a country who are second, third generation 
of that country and know nothing else than what it is to be a, a national from that place. But to a lot of people, they may see the game as, as not for them or for the a majority population because they, they see a, a certain colour on, on, a, on a cricket field or, or hear a certain language that there, there might be some, um, some pushback. And with so much noise and so many other things out there for kids, especially to, to, to do, whether it's from a sport or from a, um, just a general interest point of view, you know, it's not, we're not just fighting against seasonal sports anymore. We're fighting against computer games and anything that's in your in your fist that you can look at actually getting them to choose sport in the first place is a, the first challenge but then to choose cricket um and that's actually cricket scotland's you know tagline is choose cricket but that's a huge challenge for cricket in any nation but especially where it's a, a nascent sport um, played in only in pockets of the community in, in, in associate nations yeah absolutely you you brought up a very interesting point there about you know ex expats or immigrants playing the game in countries where they're not necessarily from or have been for a while. However, the game hasn't developed and grown necessarily or gone outside of those pockets. And I was having a chat with Amjad Javed not too long ago who played for the UAE. And his background's obviously Pakistani. And what he said to me was, let us go take this game to schools where the nationals of the UAE are playing the game and let us show them what it's about and what it means. But unfortunately, they haven't had that opportunity ever within UAE cricket to do that. Hence, such a limited number of nationals coming through in the game. What is your opinion particularly on that point? And how do you think that perception can be uh, changed or tampered with perhaps? Yeah, it's, a, it's a real delicate point that's so intrinsic to, to cricket's future um which even within the emerging cricket whatsapp group for example of which there are as i mentioned sort of 40 of us there when we get talking about about uh, about this topic in particular there's always a, a lot of emotion and a, and a lot of opinion because of the passion that, that comes into it and you know people suggest everything from from quotas um in national teams for those who are and it's some some words here that kind of get misused but natives of a country indigenous people of a country but then that rolls into should we have minimum numbers of homegrown players in a team um, and other perspectives of whether the icc should uh, channel some of its funding or at least have a lot more um, a basis of the, the criteria in its, in its scorecard because the ICC funds associate uh, nations with over two things. Uh, it's a scorecard of about 15 different off-field metrics where every country, every, all 92 associates are ranked and they can be funded anything from about oh, $900,000 down to, uh, uh, down to 15,000 and then also on, on a tournament grant as far as they get. So some countries can be up over 2 million and others are only 15K. But part of that are the number of players, but it doesn't specify the number of players that have, have grown up uh, and gone on to represent a national team. So is the best way of doing it, I think there's, there's many different methods of looking at it and, and there needs to be a balance there because it's not going to work in every, every single country. And that's to have a funding mechanism that creates an incentive um, for countries to, to have junior development programs rather than punishing teams that have too many, but it's a way of balancing that. But it's also cricket administrations that, that are supported in doing this and whether there are additional fundings from the ICC to have those local programs. You know, one US dollar goes a lot further in one country than it does in another to, to have these programs running. And there are some very expensive countries out there, the UAE included, to be running those those programs that, that, that Anjab talked about. Um, so my experience in, in Hong Kong probably even brought another element to that as well, where they had accelerated programs for Hong Kong Chinese background people, which is also interesting because you've got a lot of second, third generation people from, from South Asia and also, also the European nations that have grown up and consider themselves Hong Kongers as well, but we'll leave that by the by. But having some accelerated teams that had the uh, Hong Kong Chinese playing together and giving them opportunity even competing for Hong Kong um, in the East Asia Cup against Japan and China and Korea that had generally only nationals in there, or at least sort of ethnic Chinese, Japanese, et cetera, in, in their teams. But I think the key of any plan like that is to make sure that they're not getting so far ahead that you have the discontent at the higher end when you have quota systems involved. And we know it comes from a, a, a different place, but see what, um, that can happen in the likes of South Africa where you don't, and leaving the, the societal issues to one side, but I mean, once you get to that sort of top rung and having, making sure you've got your best team competing, that's the challenge for associate cricket sides as well because if their best team is not competing and not winning games, and that you can lose 
huge percentage points of your of your total funding on, on, on one result in, in particular ICC tournaments. So mm-hmm. it's about encouraging local growth, but not punishing nations that are necessarily strong, but it's also supporting those associate nations so they can run those, those courses and how to engage with governments and how to engage with schools to really help spread the story of, of, of what cricket can add to a community because you and I know on, on, on this chat that it's such a great um, it's a sport that ingrains so many great qualities in, in people working with a team, w- learning to win, learning to lose, leading from the front, leading from behind, through you know facing adversity in such a cerebral game, probably unlike any other bar a few other similar bat and ball sports where there's so much strategy. So it's not the game's problem. It's really how we best support those administrations to grow the game locally, but also show those incentives to them from a a funding point of view. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting that, you know, you end on the note of the resources or the lack of resources, which is, I guess, the overarching uh, issue that exists for a lot of associate uh, na- uh, associate cricket nations. My question is very much, next question is very much tailored around that. And it is, what what is your, I guess, view or opinion on what is required of major cricketing bodies, such as the ICC, to perhaps change this funding model or improve the amount or increase the amount of resources available to associate cricket nations? Well, I I guess we take one step back and we ask ourselves, you know, what is the ICC? And the the ICC is is run by a board of 17. 12 of those are the test playing nations. There are three associates, an independent director, a female director, that is, and then an independent chairman. So we already know who who controls that board. And with 80%, over 80% of the, the global funding out of the ICC global rights, so, you know, when they go and sell their TV rights for, for World Cups and that funding goes through, all goes to those four members. So that's around $2 billion that will filter into world cricket from the ICC over the eight years between 2015 and 2023. 400 of that, of that two, 400 million of that 2 billion will, will go to India. And then we, we kind of work down in increments down to, to England, Australia, and the other four members. But then there's only about 100, and I'm trying to get the numbers right in my head, about 160 million, maybe even less, that goes to all 92 associates over that, over that same period. Yeah. You know, put that cricket, and that, that is actually the second best funded sport globally from a, from a global body behind FIFA, uh, where FIFA has a completely different funding model. Um, they basically give $2.5 million to, to every one of their members, of which there are, I think, 206 or 2007. It, it doesn't matter how big they are or how much money or how, how big their TV markets that, it, that comes in. Um, so what does the ICC need to do? The, the ICC needs to be empowered to be able to make decisions for global cricket's sake and for, you know, it should, number one should be to to grow cricket into a truly global sport and every decision comes off that and that goes to the funding model to be, to get towards a more egalitarian funding model similar to FIFA's. I'm not saying we do it overnight, but something that could build towards it would be amazing to have global events by name and by nature. You know, a 10-team World Cup is not a is not a World Cup. And I think what that showed for a lot of people that, oh, but I'm happy to see my team play all these other teams, just showed how broken the global bilateral structure was before that. The fact that Australia hadn't played um, half of these nations in the last three years, you know, it, it made the World Cup as a bit of a novelty. Well, that tells us that the global leagues that the ICC are trying to institute are on the right, the right, um, the right pathway then, but it's also how the, the global funding from that could be pooled to actually pay for those, those global leagues. And even with some potential protection for player salaries in there as well, when we see the likes of South, South Africans and Zimbabweans leaving for various reasons, but some of it around pay, if there can be also money, they're protecting player, players' salary. So that's, that's what the ICC can be can can do but really it's going to take those big nations to make that decision uh, to allow the ICC to be an independent global body for the game first rather than being um, run by board members who unfortunately carry conflict of interest just inherently because they're sitting on the board representing their cricketing nation rather than the game itself 
Yeah, it sounds a bit like the United Nations Security Council to me, you know, but <laughs> um, there are some definitely some permanent members on there that, yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that love that love that veto, uh, yeah. that, that the veto bar ready to go. <laughs> that's that's uh, yeah, pr precisely. I think, though, however, in spite or despite of all the uh, challenges that are involved and all the potential of what can be in terms of resourcing, there is already so much potential within a lot of the associate nation uh, cricket nation uh, associate cricket nations we've seen cricket uh really come out from countries you know such as afghanistan being like the ideal example but you touched on nepal earlier on and uh you know nepal they love their cricket there i had a chat with a former uh football coach of the nepal women's team and he was telling me that you know cricket's taking football away you know uh over there so Tell me, I guess, a little bit about this potential. Where do you think it exists more so than in other places? So maybe, you know, the obvious answers are Nepal and we saw Thailand in the women's T20. But aside from that, you know, in places like Africa, Hong Kong, where, you know, you were, you were involved so heavily and so on. What, where do you see cricket really sort of emerging from? Well, I think if we take those those two examples, Nepal and Thailand, a great place to start, and and why you know Nepal has become a cricket mad nation, and really only in the last couple of decades. Um, and I think there is an element of um, proud um, Nepali kind of hand on heart there, wanting to be bigger, better than bigger brother over the border there with with um, with the with India just being there. But it's also because the the, the taste of success they've seen from the likes of, of Paris Kadka. And it was even before Sandeep came on the on the scene, but there's really been you can see that the national pride exuding there. And that's something that the sport has really tapped into there. And even with their administrative struggles, you know, that is a cricket mad nation now, as you said, and more so than a, a lot of full members out there. So if we use that as one example when you sort of tap into the that national psyche and that real sort of the patriotic love for the you know the the sport because of the love for the country and the other example is thailand where that that is generally an unknown sport in the country and that is the the result of a very clever administration that saw an, an opportunity to put a great program there that empowered girls and women moving bringing a lot of them over from from baseball or from softball you know it's a great story in itself but also acknowledging that the relative strength of, of women's teams across the, the world meant that there was an opportunity there for them to to make their splash on in in the global in global events and we've seen them already play at a World Cup and anybody that watched them go through the qualifier in Scotland, you know, they're very, I guess you say fortunate that Zimbabwe weren't there because I, I always thought that the Zimbabwean team were going to be their number one team that they were going to be vying for as the spot behind Bangladesh. But nobody should have been surprised that knew anything about Thailand. But you can see two very different stories of success so you, you think, who else is out there? What do you need? You need an engaged population. You need a, a visionary administration and also the potential of the, the a, a US dollar coming from the, from the ICC going a, a lot further. And you look, the countries that engage with sport is where, where the Olympics are popular as well. The USA, Canada, you know, they played in a cricket game in 1844 and that was the first ever international sporting match, you know, for those who love their trivia. You know, that's the oldest sporting rivalry in the world. That was um, in, in New York of all places in 1844. And the USA, you know, is one of the world's biggest cricket watching TV markets. The problem is that it's a lot of first and generation Americans that have come from South Asia watching cricket in South Asia rather than watching American cricket. And, you know, USA Cricket has sold a billion dollar um, franchise deal with the Times of India and Willow TV to run a, a, T, a T20 franchise league. And they've just started some exhibition games for the minor league. So if you want to talk about where the investment is, it's there. Canada has the population, but probably not the, the administration as, as well as they, they've really ticked into the national, well, you know, in, in the interest in the country, but also found those partners. But going back to countries that are into sport as a sort of a national pastime, that's where the Olympics comes in. You get cricket in the Olympics, you're going to have recognition from, from governments and extra funding. And it looks somewhere like Brazil will go from around, let's just say $300,000 in total funding from, from everyone at the moment. That would double and triple if, the, if cricket became a, 
an Olympic sport overnight coming from the Brazilian government and their support of, of sports um, that are in the Olympics. doesn't mean that Brazil have to make the finals of the Olympics, but it, it would just mean that countries like Brazil, you know, some of the numbers are staggering. Italy, between one and two million US dollars a year, and, and the numbers are like that everywhere. Germany's the same. And we, you know, the story of, of forced migration of bringing so many new Germans to the country, but how that, that has turned into a, a cricketing revolution is, is another one to keep an eye on. But those countries that have those big populations that have opportunity, you know, Nigeria, under-19 World Cup, um, T20 World Cup qualifier, Brazil, as I mentioned, Indonesia are another one there, and the, and the European nation I mentioned with, with Germany. They're the ones that I'd be, I'd be keeping an eye on in the future. There are some great little pockets of um, stories of, as I said, visionary administrations doing some great things. And when you combine that with the, the opportunity and the potential playing base of the likes of a Germany or Brazil with the funding through, through Olympics, there are a couple of exciting stories out there. Yeah, it's, you know, Olymp the Olympics are always an, an interesting topic. And, and it's uh, obviously, it's great that you brought that up because cricket is perhaps one of the oldest sports to not be in the game, uh, I think, alongside squash. But we can, we know that, you know, cricket is a billion dollar sport. Mm -hmm. Squash isn't. So what, what is the, you know, what is the issue there, in your opinion, from your understanding? Uh, how much, however much you're willing to talk about that, of course, but um, cricket in the Olympics, you know, like you said, it means so much to what can potentially happen with funding. I had a, I had a chat with um, Ver Veronica Vasquez, the captain of the Argentinian women's team. And she said the exact same thing. If we had the mm. Olympics, that's it. You know, we can make this a legitimate, a legitimate sport here mm. in Argentina. So depending on how much you want to talk about it, but uh, what, what are the, I guess, issues that sort of hinder the process of enabling cricket to get into, into the Olympics? Well, there are a lot of chat, there's a lot of chat about it needing to be the pinnacle of the sport and which format it would be and how many teams it had or could have in, in the events. And I guess looking at those challenges, they're not insurmountable. The chances would be it'd probably be quite a small final event at the Olympics, probably eight men's, eight women's and, and T20. People also ask about facilities and you wouldn't have enough grounds, and especially in these places that that don't have cricket. It's like, well, if the Asian Games can, can build stadiums for cricket um, in China, in Korea, and uh, soon in China again, but in a, a different different city, we can do the same thing with drop-in technology, with a type of hybrid pitch that we see in Vanuatu that doesn't have a, a permanent um, clay centre. It has a, an artificial underneath with, with long... Um, fake grass with uh, the clay on top that you roll that you can that you can reuse there are a lot of opportunities there so anyone that tries to use that as a reason it that's not, that's yeah. really not an answer because we can play t20 internationals on on synthetic at the moment and if that is what we would need to do to get the, the game the olympics honestly it, it's worth it the root the two big blockers have always been india and england uh, england was always concerned that one out of four summers um, messed up with with Olympics being the middle of when their their main time was, but they've they've changed their mind in the last three years. They've come out in support of the Olympics, and then the BCCI in India have had issues with the in Indian Olympic Committee and the fact that this team would be controlled by the Olympic Committee rather than the BCCI, and they also had a an issue with WADA's um, everywhere, um, anytime location around testing, which has now been ticked off as well. So it's really that last seat at the table, India's support. And it's gone a little bit quiet on the Olympics of late. You know, the people within the ICC say it's still, it's still moving along, but it's been, you know, the silence has been somewhat deafening in that with the 2028 Olympics, which is when we are hoping it'll, it'll be in, in, in LA and LA has cricket fields. So again, the facilities is not the issue. They should be announcing the sports. I think it is in 2021. But look, as we know at the moment, with a, an Olympics being postponed, who knows whether they're going to start lining up the sports um, for future Olympics. But I just hope the right people are having those right conversations because, you know, we, we talk about it a, a lot of time. And I, you said you haven't listened enough, so it's good that I'm not repeating it that you're already here, but basically getting the cricket in the Olympics just solves so, not so, solves so many problems, but creates so many opportunities in that there's this funding that we're talking about and potentially getting an egalitarian funding model from the ICC. 
the money from these governments for Olympic sports, it's more or less free money if we look at the way that the cricket has been funded in the past. Cricket trying to make its way in these countries, trying to find commercial uh, entities, commercial partners, and that's only going to get harder and harder. Linking with go governments that are probably all going through austerity measures now anyway, but to be able to tap into a national sporting budget, albeit they may be reducing with what's happening in the world, that's just something that the ICC should see. Well, these are, it's really doing not doing our job for us, but just complementing and increasing the potential funding that maybe we'd be talking less about the ICC funding if we had a lot of that coming in from, from these governments. So unfortunately, it sounds like it's been from a, a couple of countries at the top table, but geez, I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping I occasionally write down these little dates and, and thinking about where I'd like to see World Cups and T20 World Cups. And there's another opportunity of having World Cups and Associate Nations. But the, the idea of having Olympic cricket is, is one that really excites me and something that could just be such an amazing thing for the game. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, for example, no disrespect to break dancers, but break dancing is in, in the Olympics. I think cricket should be there as well. Um, and let's hope that it's just a matter of time rather than when will it actually happen. Um, I wanted to sort of move on and switch direction a little bit, Tim, and talk to you, obviously, about emerging cricket you know, one of the solutions to all the myriad of issues that we've talked about is raising the profile of associate cricket through exposure via, you know, platforms such as yours. What, what are some of the things that, you know, I, you know, you can call them achievements or successes or targets that you've met in, in raising that profile in of specific of associate cricket via EC or emerging cricket? I think it kind of goes back to why I started and came up with the idea of, of emerging cricket is it really frustrated me that when I was working in Hong Kong and then even after I stopped working cricket in Hong Kong, just how the emerging game, and that's the game in associate nations and, and beyond even in non-members, is covered. All, all too often, it's more of a novelty value. It's look at Dwayne Leverick's catch in, in the World Cup and look at these other things. Oh, who, who would have known that country X, Y, or Z actually plays cricket? And that's great if you're trying to just elicit a bit of interest but if you're only tr if you're trying to keep people interested just by novelty value you, you're going to lose them and whilst you know having that that interest factor and as a marketeer yourself you know that that's great to engage people but you've got to have something you know once you get them in the shop you've got to keep them in there and you've got to have things that actually engage them and and, and pique their interest and inform and, and inspire and that's what we try to do. We, we try to find the real stories about the game and the people involved and tell them like they deserve to be as, as, as much respect as, as the game going on in, in any full member nation. I think considering that a lot of these people that we're talking to are probably doing it for a lot less reward, both from a, well, generally from a money point of view, especially from the playing point of view, but also the time and effort that these people put in in high positions for no reward whatsoever. You could almost argue that these stories deserve more credence in the global cricket market than, than those telling from, from test cricket. And that's not to talk down any of the efforts of anyone there. But growing the game everywhere is, is tough, but it was trying to give an equal platform to all these nations. And I guess the flip side to that is that how do you grow if you're giving everybody the same airtime? And I think that's our, our challenge as we go forward. You know, our, the numbers on some of our, um, some of our pieces in our podcast, it's sometimes we say, okay, well, let's look at our most popular um, articles and pods and let's, let's move the, just knocking the microphone there, and let's, and, and let's move the, the Nepal ones to one side because they're always, you know, number one, number one. In saying that though, we've had huge numbers reading about the USA Major League Cricket recently as well, which may just show where the interest there as well. Mm. And with the advent of fantasy cricket um, ha, um, linking into associate cricket as well, who knows where that, that interest is going to come from. So that's what we've really trying to achieve is, is really give the, the credence and the respect to, to all those stories from across the cricketing world because I think that's the only way we're really going to galvanize that audience and there's so many different ways of looking at it we're not only trying to attract current fans of the associate game within those nations but trying to galv them, galvanize them into a global community potentially attract new fans within those nations to the game by helping these administrations and players tell their stories but also 
attract fans from full member nations who don't even know that countries that these countries are playing cricket to emerging cricket. And I don't mean just by us, I mean to, to associate cricket and beyond because there's some amazing stories there. The problem is they're not being told or if they are, they're not getting as many clicks as a story about a hamstring in the, in the IPL. And that doesn't tell me that the IPL story is wrong. It just tells me that the, the right people aren't projecting the stories the way they could be, the ICC in, included in the way that they can use their platform to to, to help grow the game, which I don't think it's necessarily the ICC's problem. It's, it's, uh, in the past, it's how they're able to bundle their rights and use all these things. But there's a, a real opportunity for the likes of the ICC to, to use all of the cricket that's being played out there in associate member nations and pathway events and also domestically that they don't have to worry about rights. They don't have to, to negotiate with the likes of a star to, to get this onto their channels. It, it's there and, and waiting to be used. And I think there's a real opportunity there for the ICC to, to do that. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. And I, and, and I will add to that, that I think one of the great ways that I've personally seen cricket uh, grow amongst populations who don't really know anything about the game is by actually having them try it out. And I had a, mm. growing up in, in the UAE, I had, a, I had an Iranian mate who would hit the most magnificent sixes you could ever imagine. And you know, he went back to Iran and the game was over. That was it. Never, never heard of it again. Um, look, I, you know, I feel like we can keep on going, Tim, and there are a lot of, uh, dis- a lot, a lot more questions that, um, you know, maybe one day I'll have with you off, off screen. Um, but I did want to leave it and maybe, you know, you can come on the show a year down the line, t- tell us more about all the great work that uh, Emerging Cricket is doing. I particularly like the, uh, long form stuff that you guys do. Uh, there was that recent, I think it was a two parter by someone on the big three. Um, and that was, that was really, really interesting. So I really, uh, enjoy the work that you're doing. I, one last question for you, Tim, what, I guess, what are some of the things that, uh, you know, our listeners or viewers can expect from emerging cricket what do you have in store that people should perhaps keep an eye out for in, in the near future or soon? I was going to say, firstly, I apologise for sweating. You can tell I'm in Brisbane and, and the uh, weather's starting to turn, can't you? I can just see myself <laughs> sweating. But uh, um, one thing, like, it's to that point of giving every country uh, the credence and the coverage, we've started building and, and publishing a profile on, on every nation that plays cricket, you know, whether they're an ICC member or not. Some of those not examples are Tajikistan, Switzerland, and, and, and more to come, the likes of Morocco and even, even Mauritius. But to basically have a homepage with not only a link to all of our current stories, hopefully that we've had current stories, but also a basic profile and social links and, you know, some, some key numbers on, on how long cricket's been played in those nations and how many people are playing. You know, I think, you know, while Wikipedia is a great resource for people, it's a quite a static resource for people to learn about these places. And if you're searching for cricket in Morocco, it's very hard to find what's happening there right now with an up-to-date uh, homepage. So that's something uh, I think we've counted out 132 different countries play cricket. We, we may even do at the back end of the line a profile for each full member nation, but I don't think that's going to be our our, um, our focus for the, uh, for the time being. But that, that's a, a real labour of love there with everybody that's, that's, uh, that's working away in the background. That's also brought some new, um, new volunteers into the fold as well who've just seen our posts and wanting to be part of that, including people in the administrations themselves. And recently, the ICC have started a, a weekly bulletin called the, the Global Game. And I think to everything that we, we want to be and for these stories to be getting out, we're proud that, that we'll actually be writing that column for the, the ICC. So that'll be going out via their social channels in the tens of millions every week. So every Monday there'll be, there'll be stories. You know, recently we saw Jonty Rhodes sign up to relocate and to, to coach Sweden. Um, you know, we had that, where that story first, thankfully, for a number of weeks, but we sort of held on to it because he had his, making everything right with his visa. But there are stories like that that will really bring associate cricket nations and beyond into the, the, the global sphere if they are being projected from the likes of the channels of the ICC. And that's where I see what we're doing is a really as a partner of the likes of the ICC and boards themselves rather than an adversarial media nature chasing clicks. I think it's all about getting cricket to as many people as possible. So, you know, like I said earlier, the challenge for us is, is having all this content on these nations. How do we best engage our, our current audience and grow that audience to get that story 
to as many people as possible. And I think some great people that have come on board recently in the digital marketing world, some huge names on their CV that I'm humbled would want to be part of EC. I come out with some really exciting ideas about how we do that best. So I guess just keep looking out and maybe you're going to see us before you even are looking for it. Um, so that will mean that we're succeeding and hopefully it, it piques your interest and it draws you in. And But always we're there for any uh, any suggestions or feedback as well. We're all very very open on, on social media and, and engaging with everyone about the ideas of what we can do better. And I think that's one of the great things about what emerging cricket is. We've been so organic in, in where we've got to now. That's really just been a, a collective almost. We've crowdsourced passion for the game around the world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think I've uh, said it so many positive things myself already over the course of the video cast, but honestly, Tim, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you and you know you guys are doing once again i will say it's some phenomenal work to grow the game the beautiful sport and that too in places that perhaps deserve the opportunity to share what's going on and what they're able to do via cricket thank you so much for being on the show and it's it's been an absolute pleasure mate no oh, so shannon pleasure's all mine as i said great to be asked and if you ever want us back i'm happy or any, anyone else from ec i'm sure would be happy to come on as well so thank you very much for having us on Fantastic, mate. Absolute pleasure. And for everyone watching and listening, you can once again check out Emerging Cricket in the description, in the link that you have clicked this through, wherever so you are. Uh, make sure you go and check out what they're doing. Please do. <laughs>